Last week, we discussed the creation of America's first modern medical school and how the practices we use today rose to popularity over traditional and folk medicine. Part of that rise was due to the American Medical Association. While this institution is now a prominent part of the medical field, it held very little power when it was first founded in 1847. It started out as an organization for state and local medical societies, leaving out the individual physicians. But when it reorganized in the early 1900s to focus mainly on the providers, it finally had a chance to become a powerhouse in this space. Medicine was becoming more scientific and gaining more acceptance because of that. So the AMA took advantage of that, in a sense, and made it an organization of physicians, included people like homeopaths, if they would agree to the new ideas that were being accepted in the general world about science and medicine. That's Dr. Todd Savitt, a historian of medicine in the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies at East Carolina University's Brody School of Medicine. While the AMA was able to decide who to let into its organization, people who practiced alternative medicine also had a decision to make. Would they give up their beliefs in favor of a more scientific practice? Savitt says many of them refused. So the AMA continued to usher in this new age medicine without them. One of the main upgrades it looked at was the quality of education physicians were receiving at the time, which Savitt says was severely lacking. There were uh, there was very little regulation of medical schools by even within states and certainly not at any national or professional level. So the AMA wanted to do that from the very beginning to kind of organize medical education on a national level with national standards for medical education so that you get good physicians everywhere. So in 1904, the AMA created the Council on Medical Education, a group that began to evaluate and rate medical schools. They surveyed more than 150 schools and decided that only half of them could be considered acceptable. As a result, dozens of these institutions folded and many others were on notice if too many of their students failed the state exams. It wasn't always necessarily a product of bad education, but rather a lack of resources. In order to have laboratories, in order to have good dissection materials, in order to have good clinical facilities, in order to make medical education modern, you needed money. Most of the schools, white and black, existed not on endowment money, but on the fees of the students who paid to go to medical school and maybe a grant or two from a foundation or something, but not nothing like what we see today. Medical schools, most medical schools ran on a shoestring and did it with student money. As medical schools all tried to meet the same standards, they had to find money for additional faculty and new facilities like hospitals and research labs. With most of the colleges already hanging on by a thread, many couldn't keep up with the new demand. Between 1900 and 1910, Savitt says a number of them were failing. The final tipping point, which has had lasting repercussions to this day, was the Flexner Report. The AMA, in partnership with the Carnegie Foundation, recruited Abraham Flexner in 1909 to conduct his own assessment of the country's medical schools. The catch? Flexner had no experience in the field. He was a high school teacher and founder of an experimental college prep school. Flexner who was an educator from Louisville. He was not a medical person at all. His brother, Simon, was uh, actually educated at Johns Hopkins, and maybe that's where he got the idea a model medical education from. So Flexner used that model as he went around the country. He went with some folks from the AMA, from the Council on Medical Education and the Carnegie Foundation. Flexner used the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine as his gold standard. Johns Hopkins was a newly established medical school in uh, the 1890s. It was based on the European model of medical education that included laboratories, dissections, and anatomy laboratories. It also included a four-year education. Almost every other medical school only had two, and Savitt says students took basically the same courses both years with very little clinical work. Johns Hopkins structure was much more involved. Each class built on what students learned in the previous one. 
the first two years focused on the body and disease, while the last two had students go out into hospitals and work with real patients. It's the foundation of the structure we still use today. Using this model as his standard, Flexner, along with representatives from the Carnegie Foundation and the AMA, went to over 150 schools in America and Canada. There were seven black medical colleges and two women's. Nearly all of the others were all-white schools. As expected, there were a lot of bad ones. When Flexner went around, he was pretty ruthless about deciding or saying what was wrong with schools, white and black. So it isn't that he went around and singled out the black schools as being not up to standards. A lot of white schools didn't do very well, if you read the Flexner report, because he actually itemized after a long introduction about what ideal medical education is. He went state by state in, in his report with each school and talked about every school and its strengths and failings. What Flexner did by publishing this report in 1910, sort of spelling out all of these problems of the medical schools, he cemented, in a sense, the fate of schools that were not doing very well. By 1935, more than half of the colleges had merged or closed, leaving just 66 left in America. Only two of the historically Black medical schools were left open. Due to segregation, most of the white colleges refused to admit African-American students, and it dramatically lowered the number of Black physicians. While the report was pivotal in getting us to the state of modern medical education, it also had detrimental effects for African-Americans that persist to this day. In fact, the AMA issued an apology in 2008 for its past history of racial inequality. You could argue that the medical schools that were closed were bad quality and therefore didn't deserve to stay around, and too bad that we lost all those Black doctors. But the other way to have done it would be for Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations to support Black medical schools just the way they did the white medical schools like Vanderbilt, Rochester, Johns Hopkins, to keep them, to support them, Columbia, to keep them going and entering this new medical, modern medical world. Those two foundations did not support Howard and Meharry or Leonard Medical School here in North Carolina and Raleigh or any of the other schools that might have had a chance had they been given funding. So the net result is that Black physician numbers declined hugely, and we're still recovering from that. However, Savitz says that the Flexner Report wasn't the cause of this major setback, but it did feed into the racial discrimination. The medical world was segregated and biased from all the way through American history. It mirrored American society. And though the medical fields made a lot of progress, it hasn't been able to fully heal the scars of the past. The National Medical Association estimates that only about 5% of the U.S. doctors are Black. Savitz says that his own students talk about the challenges still present in the Black community, such as trust issues. There is a trust, somewhat of a trust issue, I think that's being overcome and it's changing, but there's still reluctance among some people of color to see Black doctors. But more than that, it's that the number of Black physicians is small. It's difficult to get Black students into medical schools and then graduate and go out into the big world. I think we haven't made up the deficit that the 20th century history gave us when we started, let's say, the 21st century. You can find more information about Dr. Todd Savitt and all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. For more behind the scenes, follow Radio Health Journal on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Our writer-producer is Kristen Farah. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. I'm Elizabeth Westfield. <laughs>